So now we do some work, but I thought I'd take you through our process, how we got to the handouts that are currently on your tables. So we'll take you through our process. We'll look at how we built this assessment rubric, why it's ended up the way it is, and then the plan being that you think of a recent event from a forecast perspective and go through and make an assessment for that event. So we'll do that afterwards, probably about maybe half an hour of slides first. Once we've been through that process, then we'll get back together as a group and that's where you tell me all the things that I need to do to make my product even better. So it's a two-way thing. Okay. So the EWD journey. Adam Morgan was managing the extreme weather desk when I was travelling around the country in a caravan last year. He was the one that recognised the opportunity to build our post-event review along the same lines as our national hazard outlook. Philip King, he was the manager of the extreme weather desk, long-time colleague of mine, recently retired. Both Phil and Adam worked together to get us a long way, we like to think, a long way towards impact-based forecasting in a short amount of time with relatively little resource. Okay, so to understand the journey, you need to understand where we began. And it'd be interesting to know whether any of you are issuing products like this. Now, what I saw yesterday, it looked like there was at least a couple along these lines. Now, this is something that we issue on a Monday and a Thursday morning. We call it the Significant Weather Outlook. And we started doing it very early in the Extreme Weather Desk. So the Extreme Weather Desk has been around for about three years now. Uh, basically, we did it because the executive wanted to know or have some way of quickly being up to date with what sort of impact weather might be around the nation uh, in the week ahead. It's generally a bunch of key messages. It's heavily textual. And uh, if all you want is the key messages, it's at the top. And then we break that down with more detail. And we usually provide some kind of graphics to help explain what the problem is or was associated with various impacts. We needed to place hazard risk assessment at the core of our operations where the extreme weather desk. So we needed that that was our space and we needed to establish ourselves within that space. So uh, given that we uh, all came out of one of the seven state or territory centres Coming, uh, bringing together national products that really highlighted where our extreme weather is was necessary. But producing a graphical product based on impact and probability was the ideal. And I've already talked a bit about where we got the... Um, uh, the starting point in terms of existing severe weather outlooks, but also the UK Met Office and WMO guidelines, and of course the pace event review management. This is one of Adam's slides that he was presenting to the state and territory managers quite early in the process about how he saw, while I was away, the EWD operations falling in terms of our national contingencies. So a daily risk hazard assessment, we have the significant weather outlook, so these are the, the national products uh, on the left hand side. We do a national chart discussion or a morning briefing out of our national operations centre at quarter to 10 a.m. every morning and that's a, a, an excellent briefing for other members of the organisation that aren't necessarily involved in the forecast process to bring them up to speed, particularly members of the executive. 
We do video briefings on the extreme weather desk where on a day-to-day -day basis we're looking at detail about environments that are conducive to particular hazards and we talk through those environments with an audience of severe weather forecasters in mind so they're highly technical but a lot of other people are starting to look at them and use them and, and um, getting more and more requests for them to be used as training resources in university and things like that. So that's been a popular product. And uh, I showed you an example of the national severe weather videos that we do in national media. We do surge support, so flying members of the Extreme Weather Desk out to regions to help out when particular uh, events are, are causing a lot of operational pressure. So we're there to help with the staff planning. <coughs> Event-based data collection seems to fit pretty well in this work workshop. So we've talked a fair bit about that. And post-event reports. Now we started doing post-event reports quite quickly in terms of PowerPoint format and, and fairly technical on the Extreme Weather Desk. And of course that's all uh, merged itself into the post-event review management. So hopefully you got a bit better feel for what we've been what we have been doing over the years in the Extreme Weather Desk and say so how can we move towards impact forecasting as a communication tool, also for contingency and resource planning, how can we move towards that as quickly as possible without waiting for all the, the, the gaps to be filled in the exposure and vulnerability data that we spoke about in previous sessions. So in terms of the ABS, Australian Bureau of Statistics, the GA data, Nexus, National Exposure Information System, this is coming. It will happen in our organisation and we will have this data availability which will allow us to provide much uh, higher resolution impact forecasts in the future. But going through the uh, assessment process using the post-event review setup was what Adam recognised as being a really good way to do an impact forecast now. Not waiting until we've, got, we've filled all the gaps, but right now. Okay, so I showed you Kev Parkin's product. Um, this is the South Australian Severe Weather Outlook, so a Bureau of Meteorology meteorologist sitting with the State Emergency Service in South Australia and also in Queensland. Uh, the threshold colours stand out, orange and red for the bigger impacts. Queensland introduced a black, which I thought was interesting. I don't think I saw any blacks yesterday. Maybe a deep purple? Can't remember. So for the really high end events, they introduced the black, which we haven't incorporated, but it might be, it's something I think it's worth us discussing. Does there need to be another tier level? Uh, they're all very similar. They don't have geospatial information that could be pulled out to be used with exposure and impact data to produce an impact forecast. And, um, but they were kind of a baseline in a way for products that were going to the current emergency services. Now, the UK Met Office, we've spoken about uh, leading the way in so many aspects of uh, impact forecasting. They provide impact tables of hazards for rain, thunderstorms, wind, snow, lightning, ice and fog, and they use words to account for hazards in space and time, such as localised and widespread, prolonged or short-lived, and provide a generalised impact table as well. The words in this table are very similar to the words in the tables that you've got in front of you now. For a very low impact 
on the whole, day-to-day -day activities not affected. Low impact, some short-lived disruption. Medium impact, injuries with danger to life. High impact, danger to life and prolonged disruption to day-to-day -day routines. I don't know if you'd say we plagiarised, <laughs> but they're very similar. This was our hazard impact assessment tables are heavily based on the words from these tables available on the UK Met Office site. And, and so that's the link as well. So for wind impacts, the UK Met Office talks about instances of spray and large waves affecting coastal routes for very low impacts and right up to widespread and prolonged disruption to power and or other utilities and services. Um, transport routes and travel services affected for a prolonged period and long travel delays. So they've gone through and provided Im words around the impact for the particular hazard. For rain impacts, to Maserati, by the way, in case you're wondering. Uh, and this was one of those events where our agency uh, was in the media um, questioned as to whether or not our forecast was very, very good. But uh, this photo kind of felt like it helped save the day for us. A few transport routes affected, road conditions affected with spray and some sandy water, so for very low. Um, some transport routes and travel services affected. Transport routes and travel services affected. Get rid of the word some. Transport routes and travel services disrupted for a long period and long travel delays. The very similar words for each of the hazards. I'm not going to go through all of the hazards on that UK Met Office page. But that was the source of inspiration. Now, the words in our rubrics, we know, need to be refined. They are a starting point. We've started in October of last year trialling these products. So we're nearly up to 12 months worth of information mm -hmm. and trialling. We haven't changed in a deep way our process since we started. It feels like it's working quite well. In the next session, after we have a coffee break, we'll talk about thresholds and how we came up with these sorts of numbers. But in the next 15 minutes or so, we'll just go through some of the words in our hazard impact assessment tables. So zooming in, I talked about the various rows in the tables up the top, so that's these rows up here, up to land and vegetation. Mostly, well, the thinking was mostly representing vulnerability. Who might be vulnerable to the particular hazard that you're thinking about? So vulnerability of life, a vulnerability of property, emergency services and transport. And for each threshold, we plucked out words that would match that threshold. So for low, minimal danger, uh, normal demand, no impact, minimal and remote. For moderate impact, we start ramping up, using the UK Met Office as uh, inspiration. Minimal danger, few injuries, localised or brief disruption, local, brief, localised, for high impact, some danger, some injuries, widespread damage, major transport, main roads, widespread disruption, extreme impact, significant danger, many injuries, extensive damage to structures and properties, prolonged widespread disruption. We wanted the words to as I assume the UK Met Office did, to reflect the level of the impact that we were worried about given a particular hazard. Then 
the exposure was thought to be incorporated in the last two rows. So population exposure and spatial exposure. How many people are likely to be there? Rural towns or capital cities? Low population density or high population density? And the spatial exposure, just local points or multiple forecast districts or widespread and multi-state for us uh, would, would nearly represent larger areas than uh, a lot of the South American countries. Uh, for the duration, less than three hours all the way up to greater than 24 hours. Then the impact modifiers, we've looked at this briefly already, but again, the words are important. So, no recent weather impacts, recent severe weather, recent extreme weather impact and major recovery still ongoing. We know that the ability to prepare for a hazard is significantly reduced if you're still in recovery from the last. Think of Japan in the last few months. Now, the operational impact, we wanted the words to match. We wanted things to line up. We want things to be aligned so it, things flow nicely between our contingencies internally and how we're messaging the problem externally. So for low impact to our operations, same words, or very similar words, marginal, no severe, minimal danger, routine, routine liaison. For moderate, low and severe, severe weather, routine contingency, increased internal, brief disruption, High and severe weather of populated areas, some danger to life, uh, some injuries, external surge report, uh, support required, major transport <coughs> issues, extreme impacts on operations, extreme severe weather, populated areas, significant danger and many injuries, extensive damage, prolonged external surge support, critical transport routes and travel services affected. So hopefully the words align, I'll be really interested in your opinions on how you might reword anything that you find as we go through the exercise during this afternoon. Now, for the likelihood of the hazard, these words are important too. Not current official forecast policy, unlikely. <coughs> Mostly, if something's in this section, we're probably not going to consider it too much in terms of the impact. If something's unlikely, then following risk uh, protocols, considering it to some extent, is useful. But on the whole, we're usually sitting somewhere in here when we're doing impact forecasting and starting to draw areas on our product. So possible, not current official forecast policy, medium long-term forecast period, computer model guidance very inconsistent, other forecast scenarios are considered more likely. And most of us in the room are operational meteorologists or at least have spent a lot of time with them. And I'm sure most of those words mean something to you for your day-to-day -day operations. But in terms of possible, we recognise there's another scenario. The scenario where it's not current official forecast policy, but there's another scenario in the guidance that is worth thinking about. You might even be talking to your emergency services about it, thinking it's a low probability, but we need to start the communication going. It's in the short to long-term forecast period. Computer model guidance remains uncertain and other forecast scenarios considered to remain possible. Yeah, I could have done that, sorry. Um, likely. I think most of us would be pretty across current official forecast policy. Uh, majority of guidance agrees. Other scenarios unlikely. 
and almost certain every single ensemble member in your ensemble model agrees and the short term forecast is that's imminent. The guidance is right on tap, it's on board and there's no reason to think that a, another scenario is likely to occur. Again, these words might need some modification, be interested in what you think. Now, there's some talk earlier on about different hazards and how you might deal with different hazards. And the, uh, I've just presented how the UK Met Office have a table for describing impacts for different hazards. When we started considering different hazards going through our trial of this product, it started to highlight some issues. Now, some of you might have picked up that in the post event review management tables, they're slightly different to the tables you've got in front of you than in the National Hazard Outlook tables, where we took the exposure and duration out and made them as an impact modifier. Now, why did we do that? It's a couple of reasons. Consider fire weather. How do you forecast the impact of fire weather if the fire hasn't started? You don't know where the fire is going to start. You can be really confident a fire will start somewhere given the conditions and the environment that you're forecasting. On some days you'd think it would be a miracle if a fire didn't start, but you don't know where that fire is going to start. So how do you make a... Uh, how do you consider who's going to be exposed to that fire? If the fire starts and threatens a population dense area, it's going to be a very different impact than if the fire starts, which is common in the middle of Australia, uh, or southeastern Australia particularly. We have large areas across our southeastern ranges, uh, right across our ranges along the east coast, where there's very little population density and fires can burn hundreds of thousands of hectares with little impact. Another thing we started realising is that we could start overloading our National Hazard Outlook with graphical areas that are likely to have little impact. And we started doing that. Uh, initially, I, I talked about how we decided not to have agricultural impacts. One of the reasons is because we didn't have the vulnerability and, hazard in, uh, and exposure information. But when we started considering frosts coming into spring, we thought, oh, well, there's a reasonable chance that there will be some impact from that frost. And we start drawing all these big, broad areas, but they're quite low impact because they're big, broad areas. If you have, if you consider the spatial exposure, then quite quickly you can start getting towards a six. If you've got a few other numbers that might be pushing up into the moderate somewhere. So, that's why we inserted these words here. If a hazard impact level is less than two, consider not including the hazard if no risk impacts increasing in tier. If no risk of impacts increasing in tier, i.e. you're quite certain that it's going to be a low impact and stay a low impact. If you've only got a couple here, one or two, then it might be over a really broad area, in which case you'd be up into the moderate quite quickly but it's unlikely that the post-event review is going to verify as being a moderate. So these are things that we did during the trial that make sense to us at the time to provide a more realistic assessment of the impact in the forecast. OK, we'll talk a little bit now about how to consider regional differences in hazards, <coughs> climatological differences. Heavy rainfall in one part of Australia means something very different to heavy rainfall in another. I can imagine it would be very similar for the northern part of Argentina versus the deep south. Uh, this is, a, this is a, one of the... I spoke a little bit about the Senate estimate where our CEO goes in front of the Senate. We provide him with this. 
It's just one PowerPoint slide that's got all the post-event review management uh, events for the nation for the financial year. It gets pretty difficult fitting them all in, believe me. So how to consider regional differences in hazards. Now there's a little bit of discussion on this in the debate. Uh, the way most of our warnings are set up is so the impact will be the same in different parts of the country. So the sort of, uh, like, just two rivers side by side. Minor flood, the, the depth in that river to get minor flooding versus moderate flooding could be significantly different in those two rivers. The hydrologists in the audience get it. Most of us who have been feeding hydrologists rainfall forecast information our whole careers understand that intimately as well. So, for our, I'll get the right buttons, for, for our minor flooding, uh, the impacts, low-lying areas next to water courses are inundated, moderate, moderate, uh, so moderate in flooding, uh, the area of inundation is more substantial, major flooding, in addition to the above, extensive rural areas and or urban areas are inundated, many buildings may be affected above the floor level evacuation of the flood affected areas may be required. In Tasmania, a major flood and the impacts should match the impacts to a major flood in Queensland, even though the rainfall to, require, to, to cause that major flood could be very different. So align the impacts independent of the region. Using heavy rain that leads to flash flooding as an example, here's the development product, that thunderstorm forecast that I was talking about earlier. No worries. Heavy rainfall forecast, you can see we've actually gone for a higher contour. If you get a thunderstorm in this area, we're expecting 30 to 50% chance of heavy rainfall. Now what's heavy rainfall? How do we define that? We define that by considering how city drainage systems have been built. I think this might be fairly standard in, uh, internationally, not sure. Basically a one in ten year average recurrence interval is the sort of rainfall that uh, most of our city drains can handle. Not all, but most. So we define our heavy rain as exceeding a 10% annual exceedance probability. Now again, the hydrologists will understand the very subtle difference between average recurrence interval and annual exceedance probability, but they're very close. I won't go into it. And uh, if you look at the annual exceedance probability for one hour across New South Wales, you can see in the far southwest, in the drier areas away from the coast, around 25 millimetres or more rain in one hour would exceed the 10% AEP. But up along the north coast where you've got a warm East Australian current, you've got monsoonal moisture that comes in during the warm months of the year, you can be looking at 55 to 60 millimetres in an hour before you exceed the 10% AEP. So very different rainfall amounts will verify a similar impact, theoretically. I know for certain that in Wollongong, flooding, flash flooding will start occur occurring when they're down around the 45 to 50 millimetre range. And so we actually change uh, in some parts where we know what the impacts are likely to be, we change the threshold for the rainfall rate that we warn on. But the idea remains the same. Heavy rainfall, no matter where you are in Australia, should have a similar impact. So there was talk before about how much rain per hour, whether it's in duration, whether it's over six hours or an hour, etc. Heatwave, another example. And we're still struggling a little with the best way to 
deal with heatwave when we go through and uh, assess the impact, both uh, in a forecast sense and in a review sense. Numerical weather prediction models do a very good job of picking heat over Australia because particularly dry heat, there's no diabatic effects and there's less things to go wrong in the model. Like a modeler said to me once, they're very good at forecasting when the sun comes up and when the sun goes down. And when there's no cloud around, the models do a very good job of figuring out how much heat's there. A lot of the time we can be very confident about heat, how much heat and how long the heat wave's going to last because of the spatial exposure and the duration in the assessment tables you've got in front of you, you start getting quite large numbers quite quickly. But a heat wave in Hobart compared to a heat wave in Darwin will occur with very different temperatures. Uh, in the summer months, Darwin has temperatures averaging around 32 to 33 degrees maximum and about 23, 24 degrees as a minimum. It's hot, it's sticky, it's wet, you get thunderstorms every afternoon. If Melbourne was receiving such temperatures, it would be a heat wave. But for Darwin, it's not out of the ordinary. So we define a heat wave as three or more days where the max and the minimum temperatures are unusually high for a location. The minimum temperature is important because what we've learnt from health authorities is that it's the recovery you need in a heat wave. And if you don't get recovery overnight, that's when uh, more health problems start. So for a severe heat wave, say, challenging for vulnerable people such as the elderly. Same impact for South East and Southern Australia as Northern Australia by considering whether or not the temperatures are unusually high. Agriculture, I've pretty much gone through this. You can identify a hazard. We need the exposure and vulnerability data to assess it properly, not currently including it. And the current strategy is to have some of our uh, business solutions people with expertise in who's exposed and who's vulnerable to what hazard at any given time to come and talk to us about it on a day-to-day -day basis. We can consider it. We might even draw an area somewhere in a draft product or template and then verify it and see whether or not we can provide skill in forecasting that impact. That's our strategy to move forward. I think we've got... Uh, sorry. Not sure how I did that. We've got to... All good? 50 minutes from now? I'm just thinking, if anyone... <laughs> I'm just thinking, um, if anyone's got any burning questions, we'd probably take a couple uh, before we roll our sleeves up and, and do a bit of exercise work. No, nope, beautiful. Okay, let's think about an exercise. Think pair share, think partner share. Anyone come across that idea before? So my idea here is basically for me to get information out of all of you, so for my own benefit. Hopefully we all benefit as well, but uh, this is the point where you become more of the expert than I do. You tell me what's good, what's, what's bad, what you'd change for, for your needs. Think of an event. That's the, and there's been a few good events for assessment mentioned over the last couple of days already. Think of, of an event that you know well, that you worked through. Ideally, remember the guidance that you had leading into that event. Were you confident? Were you not com confident moving into it? On your own, go through the hazard community 
operational rubrics, the community and operational impact and the hazard probability rubrics, and assess in a forecasting sense what level of impact you get to using those tables. Now, with the translation, the Spanish... Uh, the, the way we set up the tables in our English versions, they all fit very nicely on one A4 page. But with the translation, they've spilled over onto other pages. Um, so hopefully that'll make sense for, uh, for you all. Go through the process on your own, think about it, and then discuss, and, and maybe spend, we'll spend five or ten minutes doing that, and then discuss with your colleague from your country. Ideally, you, you pick the same event. And, uh, and then discuss with your colleague how they assessed it. Once we've done that, we might come back and share with the group, what did you agree on? What did you compromise on? What did you argue on? What did one person assess as being different to another? Go through and look at every one of the rows and every one of the options you've got to think about as you go through the process. As you go through it, I think it's highly likely that you'll start thinking it would be nice if something else was in. Uh, when I went talked to our crisis coordination centre, they said, how come you haven't got a, a row for marine? And I said, well, it's kind of there with transport, but they've got a point would be good to have a, a row specifically for marine and the impacts on marine transport. See how you go through it and um, in, say, five or ten minutes, we'll make a call and ask you to pair together. So roll the sleeves up. Should be fairly quiet in the room for the next five or ten minutes as you go through it on your own and then things will start getting louder and we'll enjoy that. Thanks.